Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back again with another historical video. Today, we finished unit one, uh, chapter three, I believe. Um, and we're just going to talk about some enlightened monarchs today. So let's get into it. All right. Um, so it's a long title, a long, uh, section lesson, uh, title enlightened absolutism and the balance of power. All right. That was your warm up objectives. Uh, students will be able to identify the relationship between, uh, the beliefs on the philosophs and enlightened of the philosophs and enlightened absolutism compare and contrast european enlightened rulers and identify the alliances and territories involved in the seven years war all right absolute so uh enlightenment thought had influenced european politics in the 18th century as the philosophs believed in natural rights for all people excluded freedom of equality before the law freedom of religious worship freedom of speech freedom of the press and freedom of the right to assemble to hold property and to pursue happiness all of that uh to establish these rights philosophers believe that they must be governed by enlightened rulers so enlightened leaders they believe must allow natural rights and nurture the arts sciences and education and above all they must obey and enforce all laws fairly for all subjects only strong monarchs could bring about the enlightened reforms society needed. In the late 18th century, a new type of monarchy, enlightened absolutism, emerged. In this system, rulers tried to govern by enlightenment principles while maintaining their royal powers. It's kind of a catch-22, a little bit of, we'll try this um, and see if it works. All right, glory days. So, two able... Prussian kings, Frederick William and Frederick II, made Prussia a European power in the 18th century. Frederick William I, oh, I forgot that first part, maintained a highly efficient bureaucracy of civil service workers. They observed the supreme values of obedience, honor, and above all, service to the king. He said, one must serve the king with life and limb, and surrender everything except salvation. The latter is reserved for God. Everything else must be mine. So uh, Frederick William's other major concern was the growth of the army. And by the end of his reign in 1740, he had doubled the army's size, making it the fourth largest in Europe after France, Russia, and Austria. Because of its size and reputation, the Prussian army was the most important institution in the state. Members of the nobility who owned large landed estates with many serfs were officers in the Prussian army. These officers, too, had a strong sense of service to the king or state as Prussian nobles believed in duty, obedience, and sacrifice. So this is Prussia in 1740. And then under frederick who we're going to talk about uh these little light light pink hot pink what they're going to acquire that's william F frederick i think i mixed up his name so how great was he frederick the second or frederick the great ruled from 1740 to 1786 was one of the best educated monarchs of the time he was well-versed in Enlightenment ideas and exchanged letters with the French philosopher and writer Voltaire. Frederick was also a dedicated ruler who enlarged the Prussian army by actively recruiting the nobility into civil service and kept a strict watch over the bureaucracy. For a time, FTG, Frederick the Great, seemed quite willing to make enlightened reforms. He abolished the use of torture, except in treason and murder cases, he granted freedom of speech, limited freedom of speech, and greater religious toleration. However, uh, Frederick the Great kept Prussia's serfdom and rigid social structure intact and avoided any additional reforms. 
serfdom is the European version of slavery. All right, unfortunate all enterprise. So the Austrian Empire had become one of the great European states by the start of the 18th century. It was hard to rule because it was a sprawling empire composed of many nationalities, languages, religions, and cultures. Empress Maria Theresa, Theresa, who inherited the throne in 1740, worked to centralize and strengthen the state. She wasn't open to the philosophs' calls for reforms, but she worked to improve the lives of her serfs. Her son, however, Joseph II, believed in the need to sweep away anything standing in the path of reason. When he comes to power, he will abolish serfdom. He eliminated the death penalty. He established equality of all before the law and enacted religious reforms like religious toleration. However, his reform program failed since he will alienate the nobles by freeing the serfs and he alienated the CC Catholic Church with his religious reforms. And even the serfs were mad about these broad and drastic changes because, yeah, they're free, but now they don't have a job or a purpose in life to serve. Um, and you have the nobles who are largely your biggest ally, your biggest asset when running a country because the nobles have money. You as the king, you inherit the power and your royal family may have some money, but a lot of the money for wars and everything else comes from nobles because, well, they got the money and you need money to fight wars. So uh, Maria Teresa inherited, what is that? I don't, I can't tell. Uh, this area and of course Austria okay this big old they lot, lost this to there's just a lot it's a hot mess Central Europe during this time period hot hot mess even even Italy um, if you've seen Step Brothers uh, this clip is from that uh, Big Fat Failures I'll show it in class. This is Maria Teresa. This is Joseph II. All right, Russia. Russia be different. In Russia, Peter the Great was followed by six weak successors who were often put in power and then deposed by the palace guard. A group of nobles will murder the last of these six successors, Peter III. So his German wife emerges as the ruler of all Russians. Her name, Catherine II, or Catherine the Great, ruled Russia from 1762 to 1796. She was an intelligent woman who was familiar with the works of the philosophers and seemed to favor enlightened reforms. She considered the idea of a new, a new law code that would recognize the principle of equality of all people in the eyes of the law. But in the end, Catherine the Great, CTG, did nothing because she knew her success depended on the support of the Russian nobility. Kind of what Joseph didn't do. Frederick did. Her policy of favoring the landed no nobility led to worse conditions for Russian peasants and eventually will lead to <clears throat> a rebellion. It was led by an illiterate Cossack. Cossack? Which means Russian warrior. Yemelian Pugachev. The rebellion will spread across southern Russia, but it will soon collapse. Catherine then will take stronger measures against the peasants. Rural reforms were halted and serfdom was expanded into newer parts of the empire. So that kind of backfired on the peasants. Now, I will say the peasants got angry because, well, there are a lot of peasants in, in Russia during this time. And so we know Russia as the most populous country. And when you have a lot of people which are poor, who are poor, it's going to lead to a lot of unhappy, unhappy fellows. Hey, Peter. Um, this is Peter the Great. And these are the six successors after him. You have Catherine the First, his wife. Uh, I believe their son, Peter II, this is, uh, he dies without an heir. 
So then Anna of Russia was selected to lead. And then I think it was Catherine and Peter's nephew. He ruled for like a year, Ivan the Sixth. Uh, and this is Elizabeth of Russia, and then Peter the Third. Hot mess. This is Catherine the Great, though. I know she kind of looks like uh, Elizabeth of Russia, and maybe Catherine the First, but she be German. So uh, there you go. If you ever seen this TV show, Catherine or the Great on Hulu, it's about her. All right. They're great. All right. Catherine the Great proved to be a worthy successor in her policies of territorial expansion. Russia will spread southward to the Black Sea after defeating the Turks. To the west, Russia gained control of about half of Poland's territory. The other half was split between Prussia and Austria. And of the previous rulers discussed, only Joseph II sought truly radical changes based on Enlightenment ideas. That is why he is known as the most radical enlightened despot. These leaders are enlightened despots. Despot means uh, they have uh, unlimited power. So you smack the un enlightened in front of despot. And there you go. Both Frederick and Catherine liked to talk about enlightened reforms and attempted some in retrospect, but their priority was to maintain the existing system. And especially for Catherine, hello, they've had six rulers within... Uh, when did Catherine come to power? 1762? They have had six rulers in about uh, 20 years. It's not stable. And in the end, all three enlightened absolutists were guided primarily by their interest in the power and welfare of their states. They did not undertake enlightened reforms to benefit their subjects. Rather, their power was used to collect more taxes, thus to create armies, to wage wars, and to gain more power. Because obviously, you need money to fight wars the philosophes condemned war as foolish way as a foolish waste of life and resources the 18th century monarchs were concerned with the balance of power meaning states should have equal power to prevent anyone from dominating the other sounds a little familiar large armies were created to defend a state's security however they were often used to conquer new lands as well a little foreshadow that's all i gotta say uh here's tony the tiger and here's Russian expansion under Catherine. So what might seem not like a lot of land in this green olive color, it was vital because the Black Sea is an important trade route. All right, success is an issue. So the stage is now set for the Seven Years War when in 1740, a major war broke out for the succession of the Austrian throne. When the Austrian emperor, Charles VI, died without a male heir, his daughter, Maria Theresa, Maria Theresa, succeeded him. But King Frederick II, Mr. Frederick the Great of Prussia, took advantage of this confusion surrounding the succession of a woman to the throne. So they invaded Austrian Silesia, a piece of land that he hoped to add to Prussia. And by his action, Frederick refused to recognize the legitimacy of the Empress of Austria. And that whole notion of recognition of legitimacy comes to be a big deal later, much later. France will then enter the war against Austria, its traditional enemy, and Maria Theresa will ally with Britain. So it is called... The War of the Austrian Succession, 1740-1748, and it was fought in three areas of the war world. Prussia will seize Silesia, while France occupied some Austrian territory. In Asia, France took Madras, modern-day Chennai in India, from the British. And in North America, the British captured the French fortress of Louisbourg on the St. Lawrence River. By 1748, all parties were exhausted and agreed to the Treaty of I la Chapelle. I don't, I don't know if you pronounce the X. Anyways, this treaty guaranteed the return of some occupied territories, 
but Silesia was not returned. Frederick's return to re, uh, Frederick's refusal to return Silesia yet met a, yet meant yet another war for Maria Theresa. She refused to accept the loss of this land. She will rebuild her army while working diplomatically to get France to separate from their ally in Austria. Again, same picture, Maria Theresa. The um, red is Maria Theresa's uh, country slash um, allies. And then France with Prussia and Spain and Naples, blah, 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 blah. The Habsburgs. All right, rivalry. So the French-Austrian rivalry had been, in fact, uh, European diplomacy uh, since the late 16th century. That's the 1500s. However, the two new rival two new rivalries replaced the old one: France versus Britain over colonial empires, and Russia. I mean, Prussia and Austria over the land of Silesia. France abandoned Prussia and formed an alliance with Austria. Crazy. Russia, who saw Prussia as a major threat to Russian goals in Central Europe, joined the new alliance with France and Austria. And in return, Britain sided with Prussia. This is called the Diplomatic Revolution of 1756, and it will lead to a world war called the Seven Years' War, fought in Europe, India, and North America. So, there you go. Foreshadow. So, Europe witnessed the clash of the two major alliances, the British and the Prussians, against the Austrians, Russians, and French. The superb army and military skill of Frederick the Great of Prussia enabled him to, at first, defeat the Austrian, French, and Russian armies. Under attack from the three different directions, however, his forces were greatly worn down. Frederick faced disaster until Peter III, remember that guy? Uh, a new Russian czar who greatly admired Frederick withdrew Russian troops from the conflict. Because of that, this withdrawal will create a stalemate which will lead to a desire for peace. The European War ended in 1763 and all occupied territories were returned to their original owners except Silesia. So Austria in the end, Maria Theresa, Joseph II, will recognize Prussia's permanent control of Silesia. They said, let it go, let it go. So this is this is the vital area that they are fighting over. Right here, Silesia. All right, no return policy. Don't you just hate that? The struggle between Britain and France that took place in the rest of the world had many more decisive results. Known as the Great War for Empire, it was fought in India and North America. The French refused to return Madras to Britain after the War of the Austrian Succession, but the struggle in India continued. The British ultimately will win out, not because they had better forces, but because they were more persistent. In the final Treaty of Paris in 1763, the French withdrew and left India to the British. So here are some battles. Uh, and in 1758, okay, the French, the French had basically all these areas, and then obviously these battles happened, and uh, they won the British run. All right, French and Indian War. So I know it's a lot. I'm sorry. Um, over on the North American continent, the French and the British colonies were set up differently. The French government administered French North America, include, which includes Canada and Louisiana, as vital as a vital trading area, valuable for its fur, leather, fish, and timber. But its colonies were sparsely low, uh, sparsely populated. British North America consisted of 13 prosperous colonies on the Eastern Front of what is today the modern United States. Unlike the French colonies, the British colonies were more populated, containing more than 1 million people by 1750. The British and French fought over two main areas in North America, the waterways of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which was protected by the fortress of Louisbourg, 
and by uh, the forts that guarded French Quebec. The other area that was fought was over the unsettled Ohio River Valley. The French will score a number of victories at first. British fortunes were revived, however, by the efforts of a guy named William Pitt the Elder. Britain, Britain's Prime Minister Pitt was convinced that the French colonial empire would have to be destroyed for Britain to create its own colonial empire and a series of British victories will soon follow. 1759, British forces under General Wolfe defeated French, the French under General Mont Montcalm, Montcalm in English, on the plains of Abraham outside Quebec. Both generals died in the battle, but the British went on to seize Montreal, the Great Lakes area, and the Ohio River Valley, and the French were forced to make peace. Again, in the same treaty, in the Treaty of Paris, 1763, the French will transfer Canada and the lands along the Mississippi, MS, Mississippi, to England. Spain, the ally to France during this time, will transfer Spanish Florida to British control. And in return, the French give the Louisiana ter territory to the Spanish. Because, you know, once they couldn't find the Fountain of Youth in Florida, they said. So by 1763, the British were now the world's greatest colonial power. So pre-war, OK, seven years war in Europe is called the French and Indian War in America, American history. So this pink ish color, rose color is what Britain controlled. Green is obviously uh, Spain and Louisiana and all this gold stuff is the French. And this is the area west of the Appalachian Mountains that the they disputed over. And of course, this area is where they're all talking about, okay? We have the, I think this is the Gulf of St. Lawrence because these are the Great Lakes. Right, Huron, uh, Ontario, Holmes, Superior. Oh, I, I can't think of the other two. But yeah, this is the Great Lakes area. St. Lawrence River goes to the Gulf of St. Lawrence right over here. So fighting, fighting, fighting. All right. Love me some maps. Okay, um, that is going to conclude this lecture. Um, I know it was a little bit more writing, um, but the writing that you just wrote about, the notes that you just took about the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, it's going to play a part in the foundation of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, so on and so forth so that's why we talk about it and of course those enlightened monarchs those enlightened absolutists enlightened despots whatever you want to call them all right anyways um your homework is page 116 two through four page 116 two through four and yeah if you guys did enjoy that make sure you hit that like button leave a comment subscribe and i'll see you in the next one peace